Milton, by William Blake, Section 1. Milton, a poem in two books. The author and printer William Blake, 1804. To justify the ways of God to men. Written and etched, 1804 to 1808. Preface. The stolen and perverted writings of Homer and Ovid, of Plato and Cicero, which all men ought to condemn, are set up by artifice against the sublime of the Bible. But when the new age is at leisure to pronounce, all will be set right, and those grand works of the more ancient, unconsciously and professedly inspired men will hold their proper rank, and the daughters of memory shall become the daughters of inspiration. Shakespeare and Milton were both curbed by the general malady and infection from the silly Greek and Latin slaves of the sword. Rouse up, O young men of the new age! Set your foreheads against the ignorant hirelings, for we have hirelings in the camp, the court and the university, who would, if they could, forever depress mental and prolong corporeal war. Painters, on you I call, sculptors, architects, suffer not the fashionable fools to depress your powers by the prices they pretend to give for contemptible works, or the expensive advertising boasts that they make of such works. Believe Christ and his apostles that there is a class of men whose whole delight is in destroying. We do not want either Greek or Roman models if we are but just and true to our own imaginations, those worlds of eternity in which we shall live forever in Jesus our Lord. And did those feet, in ancient time, walk upon England's mountains green? And was the Holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here among these dark satanic mills? Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear O clouds unfold, bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall the sword sleep in my hand, till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Would to God that all the Lord's people were prophets. Numbers, 11th chapter, 29th verse. Milton. Book the First Daughters of Beulah, muses who inspire the poet's song, record the journey of immortal Milton through your realms of terror and mild moony luster and soft sexual delusions of varied beauty, to delight the wanderer and repose his burning thirst and freezing hunger. Come into my hand by your mild power, descending down the nerves of my right arm from out the portals of my brain, whereby your ministry the eternal great humanity divine planted his paradise, and in it caused the spectres of the dead to take sweet forms in likeness of himself. Tell also of the false tongue, vegetated beneath your land of shadows, of its sacrifices and its offerings, even till Jesus, the image of the invisible God, became its prey, a curse, an offering and an atonement for death eternal in the heavens of Albion, and before the gates of Jerusalem his emanation, and the heavens beneath Beulah. Say first, what moved Milton, who walked about in eternity one hundred years, pondering the intricate mazes of providence, unhappy though in heaven? He obeyed, he murmured not. He was silent, viewing his sixfold emanation scattered through the deep in torment. To go into the deep, her to redeem, and himself to perish? What cause at length moved Milton to this unexampled deed? A bard's prophetic song. For sitting at eternal tables, terrific among the sons of Albion, in chorus solemn and loud, a bard broke forth. All sat attentive to the awful man. Mark well my words, they are of your eternal salvation. Three classes are created by the hammer of Los and woven by Inathamon's looms when Albion was slain upon his mountains and in his tent, through envy of living form, even of the divine vision. 
and of the sports of wisdom in the human imagination, which is the divine body of the Lord Jesus, blessed for ever. Mark well my words, they are of your eternal salvation. You rise and lay in darkness and solitude, in chains of the mind locked up. Loth seized his hammer and tongs. He labored at his resolute anvil among indefinite druid rocks and snows of doubt and reasoning. Refusing all definite form, the abstract horror roofed, stony hard, and a first age passed over, and a state of dismal woe. Down sunk with fright, a red round globe, hot burning, deep, deep down into the abyss, panting, conglobing, trembling, and a second age passed over, and a state of dismal woe. Rolling round into two little orbs, and closed in two little caves, the eyes beheld the abyss, lest bones of solidness freeze it over, and a third age passed over, and a state of dismal woe. From beneath his orbs of vision, two ears in close volutions shot spiring out in the deep darkness, and petrified as they grew, and a fourth age passed over, and a state of dismal woe. Hanging upon the wind, two nostrils bent down into the deep, and a fifth age passed over, and a state of dismal woe. In ghastly torment sick, a tongue of hunger and thirst flamed out, and a sixth age passed over, and a state of dismal woe. Enraged and stifled without and within, in terror and woe, he threw his right arm to the north, his left arm to the south, and his feet stamped the nether abyss, in trembling and howling and dismay, and a seventh age passed over, and a state of dismal woe. Terrified, Lo stood in the abyss, and his immortal limbs grew deadly pale. He became what he beheld, for a red round globe sunk down from his bosom into the deep. In pangs he hovered over it, trembling and weeping. Suspended it shook the nether abyss. In tremblings he wept over it, he cherished it in deadly sickening pain, till separated into a female pale, as the cloud that brings the snow. All the while from his back a blue fluid exuded in sinews, hardening in the abyss, till separated into a male form, howling in jealousy. Within labouring, beholding without, from particulars to generals, subduing his spectre, they builded the looms of generation. They builded great Golganusa, times on times, ages on ages. First Orc was born, then the shadowy female, then all Los's family. At last, Anathamon brought forth Satan, refusing form in vain, the miller of eternity, made subservient to the great harvest that he may go to his own place, prince of the starry wheels, beneath the plough of Runtra and the harrow of the Almighty in the hands of Palamabron. For the starry mills of Satan are built beneath the earth and waters of the mundane shell. Here the three classes of men take their sexual texture, woven. The sexual is threefold, the human is fourfold. If you account it wisdom, when you are angry, to be silent, and not to show it, I do not account that wisdom but folly. Every man's wisdom is peculiar to his own individuality. O Satan, my youngest born, art thou not prince of the starry hosts, and of the wheels of heaven, to turn the mills day and night? Art thou not Newton's pantocrator, weaving the woof of lock? To mortals thy mills seem everything, and the harrow of Shaddai, a scheme of human conduct invisible and incomprehensible. Get to thy labours at the mills, and leave me to my wrath. Satan was going to reply, but Los rolled his loud thunders. Anger me not, thou canst not drive the harrow in pity's path. Thy work is eternal death, with mills and ovens and cauldrons. Trouble me no more, thou canst not have eternal life. So Los spoke. Satan trembling obeyed, weeping along the way. Mark well my words, they are of your eternal salvation. Between South Moulton Street and Stratford Place, Calvary's foot, where the victims were preparing for sacrifice their cherubim. Around their loins poured forth their arrows, and the bosoms beamed with all colours of precious stones, and their inmost palaces resounded with preparation of animals wild and tame. Mark well my words, 
corporeal friends are spiritual enemies. Mocking druidical mathematical proportion of length, breadth, height, displaying naked beauty, with flute and harp and song. Palamabron with the fiery harrow in morning returning from breathing fields, Satan fainted beneath the artillery. Christ took on sin and the virgin's womb and put it off on the cross. All pitied the piteous and was wrath with the wrathful, and Los heard it. And this is the manner of the daughters of Albion in their beauty. Every one is threefold in head and heart and reins, and every one has three gates into the three heavens of Beulah, which shine translucent in their foreheads and their bosoms and their loins, surrounded with fires unapproachable. But whom they please they take up into their heavens in intoxicating delight. For the elect cannot be redeemed, but created continually by offering and atonement in the cruelties of moral law. Hence the three classes of men take their fixed destinations. They are the two countries and the reasoning negative. While the females prepare the victims, the males at furnaces and anvils dance the dance of tears and pain. Loud lightnings lash on their limbs as they turn the whirlwinds loose upon the furnaces, lamenting around the anvils, and this their song. Ah, weak and wide astray, ah, shut and narrow doleful form, creeping in reptile flesh upon the bosom of the ground. The eye of man is a little narrow orb, closed up and dark, scarcely beholding the great light, conversing with the void. The ear a little shell, in small volutions shutting out all melodies and comprehending only discord and harmony. The tongue a little moisture fills, a little food it cloys, a little sound it utters, and its cries are faintly heard. Then brings forth moral virtue, the cruel virgin Babylon. Can such an eye judge of the stars, and looking through its tubes measure the sunny rays that point their spears on Eudenaden? Can such an ear, filled with the vapours of the yawning pit, judge of the pure melodious harp struck by a hand divine? Can such closed nostrils feel a joy, or tale of autumn fruits, when grapes and figs burst their covering to the joyful air? Can such a tongue boast of the living waters, or take in aught but the vegetable ratio, and loathe the faint delight? Can such gross lips perceive? Alas, folded within themselves, they touch not aught, but pallid turn and tremble at every wind. Thus they sing, creating the three classes among druid rocks. Charles calls on Milton for atonement. Cromwell is ready. James calls for fires in Golganusa, for heaps of smoking ruins in the night of prosperity and wantonness, which he himself created among the daughters of Albion, among the rocks of the druids, when Satan fainted beneath the arrows of Elenitria, and mathematic proportion was subdued by living proportion. From Golganusa, the spiritual fourfold London Eternal, in immense labours and sorrows, ever building, ever falling, through Albion's four forests, which overspread all the earth, from London Stone to Blackheath East, to Hounslow West, to Finchley North, to Norwood South, and the weights of Enathamon's loom play lulling cadences on the winds of Albion, from Caithness in the North, to Lizard Point and Dover in the South. Loud sounds the hammer of Los, and loud his bellows is heard, before London to Hampstead's breadths and Highgate's heights, to Stratford and Old Bow, and across to the gardens of Kensington, on Tyburn's brook. Loud groans Thames beneath the iron forge of Rintra and Palamabron, of Theatorm and Bromian, to forge the instruments of harvest, the plough and harrow to pass over the nations. The Surrey hills glow like the clinkers of the furnace. Lambeth's vale, where Jerusalem's foundations began, where they were laid in ruins, where they were laid in ruins from every nation, and oak groves rooted. Dark gleams before the furnace mouth, a heap of burning ashes. When shall Jerusalem return and overspread all the nations? Return, return to Lambeth's vale, O building of human souls. Thence stony druid temples overspread the island white, and thence from Jerusalem's ruins, from her walls of salvation and praise, through the whole earth were reared from Ireland to Mexico and Peru west, and east to China and Japan, 
Till Babel, the spectre of Albion frowned over the nations in glory and war. All things begin and end in Albion's ancient druid rocky shore. But now the starry heavens are fled from the mighty limbs of Albion. Loud sounds the hammer of Los. Loud turn the wheels of Enetharmon. Her looms vibrate with soft affections, weaving the web of life out from the ashes of the dead. Los lifts his iron ladles with molten ore. He heaves the iron cliffs in his rattling chains. From Hyde Park to the almshouses of Mile End and Old Bow. Here the three classes of mortal men take their fixed destinations. And hence they overspread the nations of the whole earth. And hence the web of life is woven and the tender sinews of life created. And the three classes of men regulated by Los's hammers and woven by Inetharmon's looms and spun beneath the spindle of Tirza. The first, the elect from before the foundation of the world. The second, the redeemed. The third, the reprobate and formed to destruction from the mother's womb. The reprobate are the first who follow with me my plough. Of the first class was Satan. With incomparable mildness, his primitive tyrannical attempts on Los. With most endearing love, he soft entreated Los to give to him Palamabron's station. For Palamabron returned with labour wearied every evening. Palamabron oft refused, and as often Satan offered his service, till by repeated offers and repeated entreaties, Los gave to him the harrow of the Almighty. Alas, blamable. Palamabron feared to be angry, lest Satan should accuse him of ingratitude, and Los believed the accusation through Satan's extreme mildness. Satan laboured all day. It was a thousand years. In the evening returning terrified, over-laboured and astonished, embraced soft with a brother's tears Palamabron, who also wept. Mark well my words, they are of your eternal salvation. Next morning Palamabron rose. The horses of the harrow were maddened with tormenting fury, and the servants of the harrow, the gnomes, accused Satan with indignation, fury and fire. Then Palamabron, reddening like the moon in an eclipse, spoke, saying, You know Satan's mildness and his self-imposition, seeming a brother, being a tyrant, even thinking himself a brother while he is murdering the just. Prophetic I behold his future course through darkness and despair to eternal death. But we must not be tyrants also. He hath assumed my place for one whole day, under pretense of pity and love to me. My horses hath he maddened, and my fellow servants injured. How should he, he, know the duties of another? O oh, foolish forbearance! Would I had towed loose all my heart. But patience, O oh, my friends, all may be well. Silent remain while I call Los and Satan. Loud as the wind of Beulah that unroots the rocks and hills, Palamabron called, and Los and Satan came before him, and Palamabron showed the horses and the servants. Satan wept, and mildly cursing Palamabron, him accused of crimes himself had wrought. Los trembled. Satan's blandishments almost persuaded the prophet of eternity that Palamabron was Satan's enemy, and that the gnomes, being Palamabron's friends, were leagued together against Satan through ancient enmity. What could Los do? How could he judge when Satan self believed that he had not oppressed the horses of the harrow nor the servants? So Los said, Henceforth, Palamabron, let each his own station keep, nor in pity false, nor in officious brotherhood, where none needs, be active. Meantime, Palamabron's horses raged with thick flames redundant, and the harrow maddened with fury. Trembling Palamabron stood. The strongest of demons trembled, curbing his living creatures. Many of the strongest gnomes, they bit in their wild fury, who also maddened like wildest beasts. Mark well my words, they are of your eternal salvation. End of section one.